Hello and welcome to The Game Changers, the podcast where you'll hear from trailblazing women in sport who are literally knocking down the barriers to challenge the status quo for women and girls across society. I'm Sue Anstis and I'd like to start with a big thank you to our partners Sport England who support The Game Changers through the National Lottery. My guest today is Alice Deering, an Olympian and one of the world's top marathon swimmers. In 2021, Alice became the first black woman to swim for Great Britain at an Olympic Games, representing a huge milestone for diversity in the sport. Alice is also co-founder of the Black Swimming Association, an organisation that advocates water safety and inclusion for black and Asian minorities within swimming. Her passion for diversity and inclusion has seen her recognised globally as an advocate for change. Alice, I need to start with an oh my God moment when I saw yesterday that you're going to feature in British Vogue. How exciting was that? Oh my God, it was so exciting. We did the shoot in like the end of March and I've had to sit on it for like, <laughs> oh my God, that's three months. So I've had to be like, not tell, I haven't told anyone. I think I told my boyfriend, I told my mum, but that was basically it. So I kept it like really quiet for a while. And then yesterday I was like, yes, I can put it out there. I can show people. I think the magazines are hopefully arriving either today or tomorrow. So I'll have like the physical print of it and just, it's like a lifelong memory that and the memento. Yeah, it's amazing. It's extraordinary, isn't it? And I saw one of the pictures that you shared. It's just beautiful. What, what a fabulous piece. Fabulous. In 2019, you wrote a really candid piece about what it was like to be a black swimmer. So I just wanted to ask, why, why did you decide to do that and why at that time? Yeah, so th- this was the first time I'd ever spoken about my experiences in swimming and my journey and kind of framing it around my race. This was the first time I, I was kind of like, yeah, I'm a black swimmer. I'm a black woman. This is who I am, but I'm also a swimmer. So it was an interesting one for me. And I first decided to do it because firstly, I wanted to get my story out there. And secondly, I wanted my story to be told in my own words first. I, I wanted to tell it and I needed a way to tell it. And my friend actually sent me that Galden were commissioning for pieces. And I kind of thought, okay, this is a great opportunity to make a little bit of money and get my story out there. And if people care, they care. If they don't, they don't. At least I, I've done what I think I should do. And yeah, it was received so well. I was g- genuinely really surprised. Um, yeah, I just it was just the combination of things. Eventually I was like... You know, obviously I've been swimming for so long. I started competitive swimming when I was eight or nine. And then I, I wrote this piece in 2019. So I'm just trying to do the math. So I was 22 years old. So it'd been like 14 years I'd been swimming and had all these experiences and kind of slowly started to realize like I needed to talk about it. And if I didn't, I would have regret when I retired. I, I wouldn't feel like I'd done myself and the sport the service which I could have done it so I thought why not now just give it a go put yourself out there if no one cares at least you tried and oh my god three years later it's it's been crazy it's been absolutely crazy but I'm loving every second (laughs) brilliant that's so good to hear so positive and as you say that you're able to share your story on on your terms too You, you mentioned starting swimming at the age that you did so can I take you back to your childhood uh, and how you first started swimming and how, how you found your love of the sport? I learned to swim when I was about four or five. Then got into competitive swimming when I was eight, just turning nine. And the reason I got into it was because my mum just, like me and my brother were going to our swimming lessons, really enjoying them. It was only half an hour a week. And one week she saw the notice board for Oldbury Swimming Club. It's a swimming club really local to my home where I grew up. And she was, she just put me and my brother in for sessions there. I remember, so she came home and was like, oh yeah, we're going to a swimming club next week. And I was like, like okay, why? And she was like, you're getting bored at home. I'm fed up with it. Let, let's get get you out and do something. And me and my brother absolutely loved it. We started off with one session a week and then quickly escalated to two and then three, four. By the time I was nine, I think I was swimming six times a week, which is kind of crazy. Like when I say it out loud, like at the time it was just, this is what I've done. This is normal. But I say it out loud now and I'm like, oh my God, I was, I was doing quite a lot from quite young. And then when I was 11, I moved to an elite club. I moved to the city of Birmingham where I stayed for a year. And then I got a scholarship at the Royal Wolverhampton School. And I swam there from year eight to 
13 and then moved on to Rathbury University for my university education where I did an undergrad in politics and a master's in social media and political communication and all alongside all of that all of my studies I was swimming and yeah from age 11 I was doing seven sessions a week and now I've currently progressed to 10 sessions a week so it's kind of, it's been crazy like when I say it all out loud it sounds absolutely insane and <laughs> I don't really know how me and my mum did it. She would wake up at 4.30 in the morning. I would swim, do school, swim again at the end of the day. And then she'd pick me up at like half seven, take me home, eat, sleep, and then do it all again the next day. And we did that for, oh, I can't, again, I can't do the maths, but from year eight to year 13. So I just, yeah, it's mad, but I've loved it. <laughs> and why was it so important to your parents? I mean, I, I, as I've got daughters that have swam and I know how hard it is that getting up in the morning and sitting poolside and so on but your mum was obviously really committed to that for you why do you think that she felt that was so important to give up so much herself gosh I don't know I think she just really really loved me and saw my talent and potential and how much I enjoyed swimming I think that's probably the main thing like so quite often I'd be like mum I really don't want to do this anymore and she'd literally say okay just you'd like maybe have the day off see how you feel tomorrow and then the next day I'd be like yeah mum no yeah we're going swimming we're going swimming and she'd be like yeah of course because she knew I needed it she knew without it I'd be quite lost it was such a big part of my life and it's just a massive chunk of time which I couldn't give up I honestly don't know what I would have done with my time without swimming it's a huge part of who I am and she recognized that very early on and encouraged me to keep going with it and it was never to the point where it was pushy she always balanced it so well of you know sometimes you do need a bit of a push but never to the point where I felt like I was doing it for her or for my family in any way which I think some athletes sometimes have to contend with like family expectations as well as their own but I always felt it was my expectations which were their utmost priority if that makes sense. <laughs> and and did you see other non-white children swimming? Did you have other friends that were swimming with you at the time as you started out? I did, yes. So I'm from Birmingham, like Sandwell specifically, born in Edgbaston, but when I was one years old, moved to Oldbury and like lived there my whole life. And it's a really multicultural and diverse area. And that is reflected in the swimming clubs in the area. So they're not as diverse as the area if that makes sense but there is more diversity in them compared to other swimming clubs around the country so every club I went to we were never the only family of colour in those swimming clubs and I honestly never really thought about race I never it never occurred to me that I was like an odd one out in any way every now and again I'd get some little like wake up calls that there is a wider issue that you're you're not aware of but as things as a whole, I had a really positive experience and there was never anything that stopped me from wanting to swim because of my race, thankfully. And you mentioned, you gave me a brief summary of your kind of pathway through to elite swimming, but but how quickly did that come and, and happen? And were you playing other sports at the time as well too, or was it all about the swimming for you? So it was basically all about swimming for me. I did try dance when I was about maybe five or six, so before I picked up competitive swimming. And I must have been so bad at it. I think I was really bad at it. <laughs> I was I was honestly like we did a dance recital and I was the second last person to walk onto the stage. And so the second most person to walk off the stage. So I was literally right at the back, back corner. <laughs> I was not the star dancer in any way. And it's it's probably fair, you know, especially being a swimmer. Swimmers are so stiff with their body movements. So I'm not a great dancer now, as as it may happen. But yes, yeah, swimming for my whole life has been like the sport for me. And I, I kind of think I would have liked to have tried other things, but I had no idea if I'd be any good at them. I can't regret the time and energy I've put into swimming because it's given me the most amazing opportunities in life. And I have no idea whether I would have gotten those somewhere else. I like to fantasize that I could have done track. <laughs> But honestly, my ankles and my knees aren't built for running either. So I think I definitely found my sport and I was lucky to find it quite early on. If you don't start by 11 or 12, there's much less chance of you getting to the Olympics. It's a really tough sport in the sense of there's like fitness needed, but also the technique needs to be learned very early on. So you don't have to worry about it as you grow up. So yeah, it's been 
it's been cool but yes yeah, swimming is is my baby <laughs> <laughs> and when did you make that move to distance swimming i've always done the longer events actually the 400 im which i think most people would probably argue is the hardest pool event was the first regional time i made and the 200 fly which people probably argue is the second hardest event was my first national time so it was like very early on i kind of realized i'm just suited to the endurance events i don't know whether just the way i trained personally whether that's something in me just made me suit to that but i don't know if it's nature versus nurture like i guess we'll never know but um when i was about 14 i switched to freestyle and started qualifying for nationals and british championships in the 400 and 800 free and quickly realized i was quite good at the 15 as well yeah i just it's one of those things i've always just been that way inclined blessed or cursed you know you can you can flip it either way most people would say it's a curse but it, it's open doors for me so i'm happy with it <laughs> Um, and what was that first experience like of, of open water of marathon swimming? Oh, my God. My first experience was a nightmare. So, <laughs> honestly, is is the worst, probably the worst experience of my life. So, the, the way I got into it, I, like I said, I, was, I got quite good at the four and the eight. When I was 15 slash 16 years old, I did a competition and did some decent times there in those events. Off the back of that, they were like, okay, we'll give you a chance at open water. We'll take you to Portugal to do a 10K, which is a marathon, a marathon swim. And my naive 15-year-old self was like, oh, that's a free holiday. This is a free trip. <laughs> like, we'll do a bit of swimming on the side, but it's not that deep. Oh, my God. It couldn't have been more wrong. So we got there. The weather was like freak weather. It had been raining and windy all week. The water temperature had dropped down to like 15, 14 degrees. And there, this was the time where we didn't wear wetsuits. So I got in, I did the race, I finished, which was a huge achievement just to finish because most of the team dropped out, like most of the people that they took to it dropped out. But the reason I kept going is because I made a promise to my roommate that we would finish the race and we, we uh, one of our other teammates jack he told us that a lot of people probably wouldn't finish the race so he just told us just focus on finishing doesn't matter where you place just finish the race and that was what just kept going through my mind the whole way around for two hours and 25 minutes swimming by myself because there will be the people behind me or people far in front and i was literally swimming by myself for like two hours 10 minutes i was probably with people for about 10 minutes i was 45 kilograms so i was extremely skinny oh my god had tiny like, yeah honestly it had nothing on me at all i don't know how i finished it actually in hindsight like went round was absolutely freezing touched the finish pad like paddled over to the side and the team leader came over to me and was like can you get out and i couldn't do it and he was like, okay, um, just stay there. And he like hoisted me out of the water and then was like, can you walk? And I was like, I can't walk. <laughs> so he like carried me. And at this point, the wind had really picked up. It'd been raining the whole race. It was blowing like a gale. And we tried to move into this tent. The tent was literally blowing away as we walked into it. And he was like, okay, it's not safe here. We need to go find somewhere else. And for context, this race was in a rowing lake. So... There were these big rowing hangars, I guess, where they keep all the boats. And so we went in there and he sat me down in front of this electric heater, which was put on full blast. And then not, not exaggerating, there were about five people sat around this one heater, this tiny little box. And we were all trying to warm up and we were all shivering. And I just sat there and just thought, I can't even remember what was going through my mind. I just, I think I was just in shock of what I'd just done for what felt like an age and then I was sat there and I was like okay I'm never doing this again never <laughs> I was gonna say you I'm <laughs> sure that would have put you off yeah <laughs> honestly <laughs> and then yeah so off the back of that they're like okay we want to take you to European juniors we promise it'll be warmer it's in Turkey and it's only 5k and I was like okay 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 it's a trip to Turkey it's a free trip to <laughs> Turkey again like and, and you know what? my naivety actually paid off that time because it was actually so much more pleasant it was lovely although we did swim into a massive, like, I don't know what you call it, a school, a shoal of jellyfish during the training yeah. session. And 
I was screaming. I was properly like terrified because we'd swam into so many of them. It was like Finding Nemo. I don't know if anyone remembers that scene in Finding Nemo where it's <laughs> it, it was honestly like that. And the staff were like, okay, Alice, get out. And like everybody else went on swimming and they just let me get out and I just dipped. Like the next day I went and won the race. I was a bit confused by it all because I was like, I clearly have some serious issues with open water swimming, but I'm also very good at distance swimming. So we need to get over your apprehension and anxiety around swimming in open water because you're good at long distance and this is how you do long distance swimming. So you're going to have to get over it. And I'm not going to lie, it took me a good few years to get over that, like a while. But I think I'm, I might say I'm over it now. You know, I'm always a little bit apprehensive about getting into open water. I'm going to be completely honest about it. People will, will think like, oh my God, you're a pro. You can swim anywhere. I'm not that confident about it. So I, the way I get over this is if I see other people swimming in the water safely, I think if they can do it, I can do it. But if I don't see anyone in the water or something like that, I'm like, mm, it's probably not for me. So, yeah. Sorry, that was really long, but um, yeah. No, no, that's really, <laughs> I was going to ask you about uh, jellyfish and being scared of swimming and sharks and all that mm. stuff too. So uh, that's really interesting that you are so honest about it too. In terms of your day-to-day -day training, how much is, is pool-based or how much is how much are you in the open water? And 98% of my season is done in the pool. And the other 2% is open water. It's probably even less than 2%, but it's open water, but only whenever I go to competitions. Right. I haven't done a training session in UK water. Oh my God, I can't remember the last time. It's far too cold in the winter. When it does start to warm up, We that's when we're competing and that's when we're like gearing up for stuff. And then when it's at its warmest, that's when I'm resting and that's when my season's finished. And then by the time I get back into it and start to think, oh, maybe I should do an open water session in like October, it's too cold for me. So um, it's just a bit of, I suppose, a bit of bad luck with the way the swimming season falls and the way British seasons are. It doesn't Weather allow is, yeah. me. Yeah. Because like, I think the warmest they get is probably late August and September. But I'm, that's when I'm out of the water and I'm like, I don't really want to be swimming. <laughs> so... <laughs> And in some sports, we do see certain nationalities that thrive. So is that the case for distance swimming? If you live in a place where the water's warmer, they tend to be the better distance swimmers. Yeah. So again, quite naive on my behalf. I didn't realise this until literally a few weeks, like two weeks ago, actually, I was talking to my friend and I was like, yeah, the Italians are really good at open water swimming. And he was kind of like, yeah, I mean, look at where they have to swim. You know, you've got the Mediterranean Sea, it's stunning. The Spanish are quite good at it as well. The, the Americans are always very good. Australians, Dutch are as well, the French, the Germans. And whilst, like, I suppose French, uh, France and Germany aren't, like Italy in that sense, they do still have like really nice opportunities to do open water swimming. So Germany can get some really nice, nice temperatures in the middle of summer, some really nice lakes that even I've, even I've swam in. And um, the same with France, I suppose, you know, you've got the French Riviera down on the South Coast. So um, yeah, I think there probably is a correlation there and something that I didn't even realise until like two weeks ago. And I've been doing this sport for like nine years now. So honestly, I'm, this is the thing, I'm learning something new like every day with open water swimming. <laughs> I think that's what's so great about it because it's so diverse. There's so many different places you can swim. So um, yeah, it is, it's a cool sport and um, I'm proud to call it like my own, yeah. <laughs> Um, I have done. I've done a 5k before and I've thought about the 10k challenge. But for me, it's as much about what I do with my mind for that amount of time. And obviously, it's much more time than it would be for you doing a 10k. But so how do you occupy your head when you're either swimming to compete or all the you know, training, the pool training for such distance? So competing is something that I've had to really like, develop into, because when I first started out with it, I'd be like, okay, it's 10K, we need to get through this. Doesn't matter where your mind is at, it's all about what your body's doing. And it was completely the wrong way to approach it, especially when you're like wanting to compete to an elite level. Your mind has to be switched on constantly. You have to be thinking about your next move, you're moving 5K time, you're moving 8K time. You need to be knowing where the rest of the pack are, who's around you. 
Are they the front runners? Are they the ones who sit at the back? Are you somewhere in the middle? There's so much to be thinking about. And yeah, when I first started out, I was very much like away with the fairies, just swimming. (laughs) It took me a very long time to train my mind to stay concentrated because it is Mm. so natural for you to just like drift away a little bit because at some points it does get boring. Like I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Like it's not always like, especially for the women's race anyway, it's not always go, go, go. Sometimes it can be quite slow and quite steady. And that's when it like bunches up quite a lot. And then sometimes it strings out. But if you're not prepared when it strings out to go and you you miss the boat, and sadly, that's what happened to me in Tokyo, sadly. I, um, it wasn't really a lack of concentration. It was just a t- tactical execution problem. But um, yeah, in terms of competition, you, your mind needs to be switched on. In training, it's less so. But there will be some sessions where it's like, okay, I really need to concentrate. I want to get my technique right. I need to try hard. I need to be in tune with what my body's feeling. Then there is equally some other sessions where it's like eight, eight hundredths with like 30 seconds rest in between each one. And you're there and you're like, okay, I'm going to be swimming eight lots of 10 minutes, basically. And I just need to swim. I just got to swim and you know it's okay if my mind goes a little bit as long as my technique is all right and like I can swim without having to think about my technique thankfully but yeah there are some sessions where it's just like you need to switch off or else you'll get too deep into it and that's that's not what you want. (laughs) (laughs) You've mentioned obviously in those big races it really spreading out in terms of the competitors and yet in those final few meters sometimes it's really really close so how much does drafting play a part for those long events? Drafting is so so important it makes the race so much more bearable for me and I'm sure for many other athletes as well it's so key I am definitely not the type to time trial a 10k (laughs) as in you just go off it and go 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 for me, the part I love about open water is the tactics which get involved with it and knowing what your strengths are. And my personal strength is sitting in, sitting in with the pack, grinding it out, letting somebody else just drag me along, letting the pack just drag me through, reserving as much energy as possible. And then when it gets to eight, nine K, turning on and going and just giving it all for the last, like, 20 to 15 minutes of the race and the thing that I always have to bear in mind is I am hurting it is so painful every fiber of my body wants to stop wants me to get out but you have to remind yourself everybody else is going through the same pain everybody else is feeling this it is not just you who's who's like battling through this pain and I think that's a really big driver for pushing yourself through it because you, you've got to tell yourself that you can cope better than other people. And so you hopefully overtake them. So it's quite a lot of psychological talk, a lot of mental talk going on in those last few moments where you're kind of like shouting at yourself and then at the same time in the same breath, calming yourself down to find the balance of dealing with pain, but also giving yourself the best chance of performing well. So um, yeah, drafting, absolutely key. And then when when you get on someone someone's feet who's really fast and they can just drag you through it's absolutely amazing but then sometimes you've got to do the work yourself and you have to be prepared for both so it is it's really interesting it's it's um i described it as like a slower and cheaper formula one <laughs> and i wish it had the same audience as formula one i wish it had the same and like funding. impact yes yeah oh my god if only but one day hopefully people will like I hope you become more spectator friendly, basically, because it is fantastic. There's so many, so much tactics that goes on. The men's race at the moment, I, I think anyway, is completely different to the women's race where the men's is dominated by the fastest pool swimmers in the world. And the women's race is dominated by Anna Marcella who won the Olympics and both swim very differently. So it's a really interesting arena of competition at the moment. And when will you next swim? So obviously I'll come on to to ask you in a moment about Paris, but what's up and coming for you in in the months and years ahead? I'm actually taking a break at the moment off the back of everything from Tokyo and just having a really busy season and quite a busy life. And also the fact that I've been doing, I've been doing this like run of the mill swimming season for 16 years and it served me very, very well. However, I just want to take a step back, take a breath, take a moment and 
allow myself to reset because my mind is fully dedicated for Paris. I really, really want to go to Paris. I want to compete and I really want to improve on how I did in Tokyo. So that's where my mind is fully focused at. And right now, everything else is kind of like, I just need to get through to that point. And me and my coach thought it's best to take a break now, let myself reset, feel my passion burn again for training and for competition, and then get back in in September slash October and start working through to then. So and I'm absolutely loving it so far. It's been an amazing few months. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say that. Is it really lovely not having that regimented schedule after 16 years? Honestly, yeah, it's so nice. I was really scared I'd be quite lost. But um, I think it's just nice to, I, if I want to do exercise, I do exercise. If I don't want to do exercise, I don't. I don't. And I think the main thing for me, I absolutely love being able to eat when I want to eat. And there are a lot of people out there who'll be like, well, you just eat when you want, surely. And it's like, I do, but I don't because I obviously have to eat around training. I need to make sure I'm fueled correctly for each training session. And sometimes I'll eat when I don't want to eat. Or there'll be other times where I kind of like, I want to eat, but I'll just wait a little bit longer. So it fits better with the training session. It's really nice right now just being like, oh, yeah, I want to have breakfast that one o'clock in the afternoon because I didn't feel like eating at nine o'clock. So I'm going to do that. And unless you've been in a super, super, super regimented lifestyle, you probably won't get it. And th that's fine though. Like everyone's got their own thing, but that's, that's just fine. <laughs> no, I love that. It's that freedom, isn't it? Absolutely. If you've lived in that regimented life for so long, I'd like to move on if I can to the incredible impact you're having for black swimming more broadly. And you're co-founder of the Black Swimming Association. So can you let us know why you set that up and what your ambitions are for the organisation? We first got together in 2019 as a group of four of us, including myself. We were kind of chatting on WhatsApp and we all knew each other loosely because we'd all heard of each other's projects. Like I put out my piece in Galden by that point. Eddie Cura had made a film called Blacks Can't Swim. Seven Jones was a BBC journalist at the time and she had done a podcast on black women in swimming. And Danielle Obey was creating her own swimming headwear for black people and black women and we all just got together and was like we want to do something about this we've all got individual pockets of knowledge we all come from like different perspectives on swimming let's give this a go so in 2020 we went live we went public and loads of people want, wanted to work with us we've we've found a group of amazing partners at the moment key ones are the rlni um speedo sport england and sport wales we're doing some amazing research with the rlni around bone density and physiology so we're kind of looking to disprove this idea that black people's bones are too dense to flow or that black people can't float as well as white people and we're also looking into the cultural yeah the cultural reasons why people don't swim so what issues are black and Asian minorities facing when wanting to get in the water or maybe even not wanting to get in the water and what do they feel is preventing them from doing so. And so basically we're looking for the BSA, the Black Swimming Association, to be the bridge between black and Asian communities and the aquatic sector. And we really want to, to bridge that gap and give people the opportunity and the access to be able to swim and to be able to swim well because for quite a while swimming has been viewed as I, I guess a sport or something quite privileged but it is an essential life skill it should be something that everybody has fair and equal access to an opportunity to be able to swim if they want to go on to competitive swimming that's absolutely great but if not being able to swim 25 meters comfortably tread water be comfortable with your face in the water these are all basic, basic things which everybody should have access to and hopefully everybody should learn. So one thing that I realised with working with the Black Swing Association is the importance of everybody's individual stories and opportunities with swimming. So, you know, it's just as important someone going from being a child through the elite levels of swimming up to making an Olympic final, getting an Olympic medal. That's just as powerful as an adult or a child taking their first steps into the water for the first time to learn to swim 25 metres, because they're both individual opportunities and journeys with the water, and they can shape each person's life in their own way. And that's 
they're just as important. They can inspire people to the same level and everybody should get that chance. And can you tell us a little bit about the Our Swim Story initiative that's been launched by Mm -hmm. the BSA? Yes, so the Our Swim Story is a large part of the research which I was referring to where we're trying to understand people's stories behind swimming. You know, everybody has a story about swimming, whether that is I do swim, I don't swim, I did swim, but I don't do it anymore. We want to hear people's stories from black and Asian communities so we can understand how to how to approach everybody, what what we need to change, what the aquatic sector needs to change in order to get everybody learning to swim. And yeah, it'd be absolutely amazing if anybody listening wants to take part, wants to tell their story, just search our swim story, but you can access it through the Black Swimming Association website if you want as well. And yeah, it is it's it is a great piece of research and I really encourage everybody to get behind it if you can please. And I'll pop a link in the um, in the show notes as well so people can see that too. I do remember, I was at Loughborough too, but I remember at Loughborough in the 80s, uh, and you've mentioned like, kind of hearing that concept of the thicker bones and more likely to sink but stronger, et cetera. And it feels really uncomfortable talking about those stereotypes now when you think about that dehumanising and, and perpetuating those racial stereotypes through myths like that. So do you still hear that? Is that still very present in terms of the way people talk about swimming today, do you think? So in terms of elite swimming, I basically haven't heard it. Um, One of my friends did tell me that he was taught in like when he was learning to coach that black people can't float as well. And I was just there like, that is not okay. We need to change this. And um, I don't think it's taught anymore, thankfully, but obviously that wasn't that long ago you know this was only about five years ago so so we're talking like there are many teachers or coaches who potentially might still have that view i'm not saying that they might use that view in any way but that knowledge is still is still out there in society and yeah that's why the rni research is so important looking to hopefully disprove that and just shout 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 about it when we do but it's yeah it's frustrating because We've heard stories from swim teachers and swim coaches in the 70s, I think even 60s, who were told to encourage black people away from swimming and push them towards athletics. So it's kind of no surprise we're in a place where athletics has so many amazing black superstars and swimming doesn't have as many or swimming isn't as diverse or inclusive as athletics. So it's a frustrating one honestly the whole point of me speaking about this is that hopefully one day it won't be relevant really hopefully one day we won't have to have these conversations because it is tough you know we're talking about like serious issues and acrophobia and trauma and the struggles of black people here and hopefully one day it'll just be like oh yeah do you remember when we used to think black people couldn't swim oh how stupid was that you know I really hope that what that day comes I hope it comes soon <laughs> there's all those things around safety and well-being but it's also the joy of swimming isn't it like you know that as a swimmer I've swam my whole life that that's the thing that people are missing out to there were some really shocking sport England swim England stats last year I think that showed was it 80 percent of black children in England don't swim but actually two percent of regular swimmers in the UK are black and I guess that's the thing it's just really sad isn't it that people aren't having the opportunity to enjoy swimming too. Yeah, so 80% of black children and 95% of black adults in England don't swim regularly. And I think what's more terrifying about this stat is we don't know how many who can't swim. It is it is a tough one because we want to get people into this. But when you're dealing with stats like that, it looks like a mountain and I suppose it is a mountain, but we'll change it we'll change the tide and um we say we're going to change the narrative we want to change the narrative around how black people are viewed in swimming both in the media in society and how they view themselves as well so internally externally there's a lot of positive work going on we have a program called together we can which is a water orientation class which runs for i think it's five or six weeks where we get a group of people in I think we started off with women, we're now moving to a mixed group and then we'll be doing, we're definitely doing a women's only session for the Asian community. It's it's quite soon actually at one point, but it's running in Hackney at the moment in collaboration with Hackney Council. And 
it, it's about getting people in tune with the water like you were saying it is you know how it feels because you swim and I know how it feels it is an amazing sensation it is like that feeling of weightlessness and you're really in tune with yourself you're in tune with your body it's a place for you to escape and it's about giving people those opportunities to access that feeling you might be starting out with somebody who is terrified to even have their face in water in the shower so you know getting their face in blowing bubbles and then they move to a point where they are able to swim and honestly, the whole point of the class is not teaching them how to swim. It's getting them comfortable with water and water safety primarily. And then through that, they begin to realize that they can learn to swim. And yeah, it's, it is an amazing, amazing scheme that's going on. And we're looking to make it nationwide, hopefully soon. Brilliant. Brilliant. There are clearly lots of different factors that contribute to why people might take part or not take part in sports as you mentioned earlier like cultural or economic and so on but how important do you think role models are and I, I just wondered when you look at some of the US role models like Olympic gold medalist uh, Simone Manuel in terms of inspiring you as a, a younger person for me so yeah it was quite interesting for me I never really had like a role model who I constantly looked at as like I want to be like them I feel like I took aspects from different athletes and you know not necessarily necessarily white or black, just things that I resonated within within certain people. I remember thinking about Serena Williams, like she was on a show called My Wife and Kids. It's a black sitcom set in America and she did a cameo on it. And I remember just being like, oh my God, mom, is that Serena Williams? And she was like, yeah, yeah, it is. And I was like, that is so cool. That's a sportswoman. I was kind of making a link like sportswoman show business like I had no idea the two could link and I think it's little things like that that I suppose being a young girl you see that and you think oh wow that's so cool like the opportunities that she's gained through sport and I never would have thought that I would have thought what I'm doing is possible you know I'm in Vogue this month I'm sponsored by Nike I have worked with so many amazing brands like on campaigns and stuff like that so I think it's just it's, it's so cool but um I, I suppose my role model who I've always looked up to is my mum she's absolutely amazing she's been busy behind me in the background actually because um, she's, <laughs> she's packing my lunch for me which is really sweet um, but yeah she, she's absolutely amazing she's my rock she like I said before done everything for me to make me the best athlete and the best person that I can be and I'm just I'm really grateful that she has been a part of it and beside my side for the whole way and she's such a strong and kind woman and if I can ever be like her I'd be very proud <laughs> and and how important is it for you to be the first black woman to represent team GB at the Olympics so you now as a role model um so I'm really proud of that bit of culture and heritage and breaking that barrier i am i'm really i'm really proud of it at the same time i'm kind of like i wish it didn't have to be a thing like it would have been really nice if yeah. it just didn't matter like ideal world it wouldn't matter if you're black gay whatever it doesn't matter but it does and if by me speaking out and sharing my experiences encouraging more people to swim if i can get more people into swimming just learning that life skill, again, forgetting about the whole competitive side, just learning that life skill is so important. And if I can help do that in any way, it's worth speaking out about and it's worth taking up that mantle, even though sometimes it's a bit like, oh my God, there can feel like a lot of pressure, but I always see it as positive pressure of people rooting for me and just wanting to be my best self. So yeah, it, it's cool, it's cool. <laughs> We've been talking quite a lot the last few weeks around women's clothing and the things that stop girls from taking part in sport in different sports. And I know that there are kind of additional challenges for black women around swimming and water on the hair and chlorine and so on. So how much of that is an issue? Can you explain a bit more for those that might not understand the extra challenges that, that young women might face in the pool? Yeah, so I was talking about this this morning, actually. Hair is such a big part of black women, our identity, who we are. And the chlorine can damage it. And it can just be really difficult to even get your hair in a state that you can get a cap over it. And especially like children growing up and, you know, adults now, myself even, growing up, 
without a cap which actually can fit over your hair and having to manipulate it in. Some people have told me that they used to have to grease their hair down with gel and then when you get out of the water, like that's obviously all gone and then you've got to go to school and like it, it's all, there's a lot to manage there and like self-esteem as well, confidence. Like I said, it's a large part of our identity and if it's not how we want, want it to be, then it's frustrating, it's annoying, and it might not be worth going through that effort in the first place. Like I said, I think there's a lot of options out there now for women and children with their hair. So I work with a brand called Soul Cap who create caps which are just larger. They're literally just larger to be able to get more hair in. And it's even it's even relevant for white people, you know? Like, not all caps have always fit people before, and I don't understand why in the first place brands were only making one size of cap it actually just doesn't make any sense when you have to <laughs> say it out loud but um yeah here, here we are so soul cap are creating larger swimming caps to be able to you know get braids in get locks in get afros in and you know give women that opportunity to go to a swimming pool and not have to stress about how they're going to get their hair in into a cap or not want to go in the first place because there's no equipment available to let them do that so it is little things like that that can open up doors for so many people. And I've seen on, on social media that you were considering learning to teach swimming yourself, I think. Is that something that you might do more of for your exploring? So, yeah, I actually, I got my level one teaching course like a couple of weeks ago. Oh, and good. Yeah, I honestly, I always said I'd never learn to teach because I was like, I don't think I can do it. Like, I just swim like I can't I was like I can't not be able to break down how to swim like that's so difficult because I've done it for so long it's just kind of inherent in me but I think it's been a really great learning curve for me and the great leveler of being like okay let's strip it right back to basics let's let's look at where I came from in the first place because I did have to learn to swim at some point and tr start to understand that process the that, that people go through and especially adults are going through and how to make it easier for them and communicating with them on on a level which they'll understand as well as children i'll do my level two at some point but probably not in the next few years because i'll get back into swimming and that's going to be so busy <laughs> and just finally what are your your kind of long-term plans for do you think about a career beyond swimming so oh my god okay <laughs> i've got quite a few like dream jobs i'm just going to read them off um I'm really into esports and into gaming, so I would absolutely love to be like an esport presenter or a host. But I'm not good enough to be an analyst or a pundit or a caster, as they're called. That's like super in depth knowledge, which I just don't have or would be too scared to try to learn, I think. So, a host, interviewer, something like that would be cool. S same applies to sport as well. I'd love to like mix between the two. I've got a massive passion for both. So, it would, abs would absolutely be amazing to do that. And in terms of like my degrees, I've got politics and I've got a master's in social media and political communication. And I've kind of thought they're always my fallback in case a life in broadcasting or public speaking doesn't work out for whatever reason. I would love to go into political communication. It's, it's quite a big fallback, to be honest, but it's a dream job. So, yeah. <laughs> How wonderful is Alice and all she's doing to drive change in swimming? I've been so lucky to talk to many incredible Olympians for the podcast. Head to fearlesswomen.co.uk where you can listen to interviews with Kate Richardson-Walsh, Lizzie Diagnan, Denise Lewis, Catherine Granger, Katerina Johnson-Thompson, Jill Scott and Jess Ennis-Hill. The website is also where you can find out about the Women's Sport Collective, a network for all women working in sport. You can sign up for Changing the Game, our free weekly newsletter, which highlights the developments in women's sport. And there's more about my book, Game On, The Unstoppable Rise of Women's Sport. Thanks again to Sport England for backing the game changes through the National Lottery and to the team at What Goes On Media, Sam Walker, our executive producer, and Rory Asprey on sound production. Finally, thank you to my brilliant colleague at Fearless Women, Kate Hannon. 
Do come and say hello on social media where you'll find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram and Facebook at Sue Anstis. And if you have a moment, it would be great if you could rate or review the podcast as it does make a big difference to help us reach new audiences. The Game Changers. Fearless Women in Sport. Sport.